Executive Director with Prevent Child Abuse New York. And we are so excited for this day. I can't tell you how um, thrilled we are that you are here and that you're part of this. We have an interesting lineup of um, activities and uh, speakers for you today. There's lots going on and we are glad that you've made time to be with us. We have um, a whole set of things that I wanna share with you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna work through a list here a little bit. Um, and then in just a few minutes, we'll be joined um, by Jacob Dixon. He'll be our keynote speaker. We're thrilled to hear him. Um, and so again, welcome both for those who are in the room this morning, but also for those who are live streaming with us. Um, we have right at about 50 people on site this morning. Woohoo! it feels good to be back together. And um, we have over 120 folks that are joining us uh, via the World Wide Web. So thank you. Um, I want to do a little bit of a shout out because we have people literally from all over the state. So um, I'm going to save Long Island for last. Okay. All right. Because I know they're in the, in the room. Um, but folks that are from Western New York, do we have any Western New York people? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, you can make more noise than that. All right. Um, anybody from the Hudson Valley region? Any Hudson Valley people? I didn't think so. North Country? Nobody from North Country? How about New York City? Any New York City people? All right, I thought we had some New York City. Capital District? Folks from the, all right, we got some Capital District people. Last but not least, anybody from Long Island? All right, I thought so. Awesome. Welcome. Um, yes. So I also want to take just a second and um, identify national level parent leaders. So we have all kinds of leaders um, that are doing work across the state. We have a lot of parents that are in the room, but we do have a few folks who are working at the national level, doing national level parent leadership. So if you're one of those people who's working at that national level in some, some various capacity, would you just stand? Got a couple of those people at least. So yeah, excellent. So um, not, not only do we have great representation in New York State, but we also have fantastic leadership in the national level. And we're proud of that work that you all are doing. Um, parents that are in the room, can it just stand up and wave your hand if you're a parent here as a parent today? Yeah, so good, good crowd of parents here in the room. It's wonderful to have all of you. I uh, very much want to thank all of our presenters. Again, we have a very excellent lineup of presenters. For those of you who haven't acclimated to um, the facility yet, so if, when you go out of this room, if you go that way, diagonal, the, the small breakout rooms are going to be in that area. There'll be people to help guide you if you're looking for a room, but they're out that direction. Restrooms are also that direction if you're looking for those. Uh, I want to say again, special thank you to Jacob Dixon for being with us from Choice for All. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have him here. And I also want to thank, um, I think the participant who came from the furthest distance, Arizona, um, Edward is going to be our speaker this evening on fatherhood issues. And I cannot wait to hear his story. If you've, if you've not already planned to be with us for supper this evening, um, please be here. Edward is going to share his story and I'm, I'm thrilled to, to hear him. Um, just a real quick nod to our conference planning um, committee. We had a number of people that worked literally for all, the whole year on what is happening today and, and tomorrow. Um, a couple of those people are in the room. Kara Georgi is here. I think Yvette is, Yvette James is here somewhere. Sarah Morrison is here. Um, and other people, Toyan Anderson, Sierra Norwood may be in the room, I'm not sure, uh, Louisa Walcott, Cynthia Stewart, Kristen Weller, Tyler Bellick, Gladys Gomez, Quentin Mason, Kim Kaiser, Kristen Rogers. This was a conference that was planned by parents for parents. So thank you for being here and being a part of this. We had a number of partners that weighed in as well. Um, and absolutely fantastic support from all of them. So from the Council on Children and Families, the B5 um, preschool grant has really made this initiative possible. So thank you to our children and families um, 
Council, Council on Children and Families um, sponsors, um, the Office of Children and Family Services, as well as had a large hand in supporting this work. And um, I would be remiss if we didn't mention Choice for All folks. Um, Choice for All has been a partner with us for the last three, four years on this work, and they have been instrumental in making things happen. So can't tell you how much we appreciate Choice for All folks. Uh, Families Together in New York State, uh, NAMI is uh, National uh, um, Alliance for Mental um, Health, um, Healthy Families, and the Children's Agenda. Um, all of them you'll see as um, uh, tabling out front. So please stop by and say hello to those folks. Get to know them. If you don't know them, they have a lot of great things to offer uh, for all of us. A uh, little shout out to Michael Georgia, Georgia. You'll see him running around taking photos today. Uh, so thank you, Michael, very much. Um, he is uh, helping us out in a big way. Um, if you, you'll notice there's a photo release in your packet if you're here. Um, today, please take a minute and fill that out. That really helps us make sure that we have the right information for you uh, re related to that. We are live streaming today. And Zoom links, if you're joining us via that, Zoom links have been sent out. If you're having um, any difficulty, um, you will have received communication from um, Geraldine from our office. Uh, please reach out to her via email if you're having any difficulties with that. But I think we've got people lined up. Then I want to say a huge thank you to my staff at Prevent Child Abuse New York. So Jaredine has been like a hummingbird zipping around everywhere. She has worked so hard and she needs a round of applause. Um, Tamaya Memoli has also been instrumental. And then if you stop by um, the table out front of Prevent Child Abuse, you'll meet some of our other staff. Um, we're so pleased to be able to serve um, you and be a part of this work. Um, it's important to us and, and we love the fact that we've had the privilege to be a part of this. So with, I'm looking at Jaredine to see if there's anything else I need to share. Here she comes. Okay. All right, so our first round, um, when we do breakouts, will be an um, empire room, state room, capital room, and then also um, this room as well. So there'll be four breakouts to start, right? And so if you are looking for a room, again, stop, Jardine, myself, Tamaya, um, somebody at the check-in desk, and we'll, we'll help you get to the right spot. So, all right. Um, at this point, I am really honored to introduce Sarah Morrison. Sarah is a, um, what can we say about Sarah? Sarah is a national leader. Sarah is a state leader. Sarah is a family leader. Sarah is an individual of immense quality. Um, she's, she's always got a smile. She has always got energy. Even when she is exhausted, she has more energy than I do. She is uh, a person who not only talks about the work of parent leadership, but she lives the work of parent leadership. Um, she is a integral part of Choice for All. She is um, on our board of directors at Prevent Child Abuse New York. I'm proud to say um, she is going to come and introduce Jacob for us this morning. Sarah, thank you. Thank you, Tim, for that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Oh, okay, that's better. Well, it's a great honor to be able to be here today to introduce Jacob Dixon. Jacob has been my mentor. Yes, you can say that again. Jacob has been my mentor for, I want to say, four, almost five years. If it was not for Jacob, choice for all, um, I would not be the able to be introduced the way Tim has introduced me. Let's just say that. Um, it is because of choice for all. Um, that I am where I am. When I started out, I was a parent. 
Um, I think that all parents were born advocates, but it takes organizations like Choice World to remind us about the advocates that we have inside of us, right? Um, and so because of that, I'm here today introducing the phenomenal Jacob Dixon. I feel like I should have curtsied after that, but okay. <laughs> Jacob is the founder uh, and CEO of Choice for All, which was done in 2011. He founded that by himself in his room. Sometimes I want to say he said garage or living room, but I don't remember that part, but by himself um, with a vision, uh, 2011, one person, um, and his vision was just that all children would be healthy and thrive um, regardless of their zip code, right? And if I get any of this wrong, Jacob, just say, mm -mm because I don't want to go down with no wrong copyright or anything like that. But, um, and he started that just with one, one um, campaign, just that children um, who had variations, that's the word that we use now, variations, um, basically IEPs, um, any issues, that they would be able to succeed. Now the choice role that started out with one campaign now has 20 different programs, okay? Um, and all of those programs are focused around education, health, and income, while supporting parent leaders and changing systems. And one of those campaigns focus on what we are, the PAC, right? Paranavisky campaign, which I happen to be and proud to be the co-chair of. So with all that, um, at the end of the day, we wanna make sure families are, are treated equally regardless of income, and zip code. So with all that said, without further ado, because I don't even know, I could go on and on and on just talking about Jacob Dixon. I, I would like to bring Jacob to the front, forefront. Thank you, Ben. I was getting ready to do this whole through the PowerPoint. I was, I was getting ready to do a speech. I was going to do it. We're going to make it work <laughs> either way. All right. But thank you all so much. Um, and again, um, I'm Jacob Dixon. I am the CEO of Choice for All. I'm a co founder. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be back. Um, I feel like this is home um, to us um, in this effort uh, with Prevent Child Abuse in New York and with the Council of Children and Families to really center in these conversations around this. And so the title of this conversation today is You Got This, because you do. Um, and it's important to anchor those conversations and talking about parent resilience and advocacy. Um, and so today, our two questions that we have, as we talked about before, is number one, how do we see ourselves um, as resilient, especially during the cur our current times? And two, um, how does advocacy support our abilities to be resilient for our families? Um, and before I move forward, if there are any kids who are talking, crying, doing anything that does not bother me, so please do not tell them to be quiet. That's just them advocating and speaking for themselves. I am comfortable with that. Um, okay, <laughs> so I just wanna make sure that's a safe space. Um, and two, you know, the goal of this again is interactive. So I may ask some questions and get some dialogue and have some group conversations just for you to kind of percolate some thoughts around it, all right? So we're gonna start this conversation with my own um, journey in this process. So I am a product um, of resiliency. Um, I come from a legacy of that. Um, and so I have some embarrassing photos of myself, but this is me. Um, so to the left is my grandmother. Um, uh, my father's from Panama, my mother's from New York. Um, and she is a pastry chef. So we were never allowed to have um, cakes brought from the outside. That was just not allowed. Um, so every year I had my own. So that was Roger Rabbit. Um, that year, because I was obsessed. Um, the first year was Winnie the Pooh. That's actually my nickname. Y'all don't call me that, though. <laughs> in order to see that. Um, and so family is very important to me. Um, and as a part of that process, um, I come from that culture of where before Spanglish was popular, that was in my household. Four brothers and one sister. Um, but as a result of that, also came with some language processing issues for myself. And so... My family, particularly my parents, started to notice different signs um, in regards to what would be considered now as a speech impairment. Um, but back then, because special education was still relatively new, they were unsure of what that was. Meanwhile, 
they supported me. No one really noticed that in my family. It was just more so of just me talking and me speaking. Um, in fact, I love school. That was my heart and my passion. Um, you can imagine in my room, it was a classroom. It was not a bedroom. Um, you know, that commercial from Toys R Us, I don't wanna grow up, I'm a Toys R Us kid. Take out Toys R Us and put Staples. <laughs> that was me, right? So Staples was me. I loved all of it, the supplies and everything. Um, I'm still obsessed with it today. That's why my staff does not allow me to order any supplies at all from it. Um, but little did I know that my family and their investment in my imagination at an early age and the importance of play um, for children underneath the age of five was actually manifesting my actual line of service and being, becoming an educator. Um, and realizing that um, there were a lot of challenges that we were dealing with in terms of my learning processing. And it got to a point of where, um, although I was very actively involved um, and was always with the teachers on that, because of my language processing, they felt that there was something that was happening in the home versus the fact that there was an issue in regards to my learning identification and what needed to be done. And so after dealing with those issues, um, my families were able to get me evaluated and tried to figure out what was going on because early intervention then was not what it is today. Um, and so when we went through that, this is what they told this brown boy this was the psychologist. Um, they had a meeting with my parents and said, he will not be president of his class, let alone president of the United States. He won't score above an 800 score on an SAT test. And most likely with his functioning, he will need support as he finds jobs. And so this is a conversation you should start having with your family. Um, he appears to be a very nice boy, um, but there will always be a disconnect. And so uh, this was a conversation with my family to figure out what this was. Um, and the reality and the truth is, this little brown boy of myself had dreams and aspirations and had goals. Um, and at one point, didn't know. But it was the will and the courage of my parents who understood that uh, their options and knowing that a no is a yes is an example of resiliency. Um, and so this is my IEP um, that I had. And if you can see in this purple circle, I'm not sure if you've seen the Zoom land, but you'll get the slides of it with my personal info. So don't give it out to everybody on Facebook, please. On there had a classification of mentally handicapped. That X that said speech impairment is my mom's handwriting. And that was the act of advocacy. That was the beginning point of resiliency. And so when we talk about where I come from and the product of legacy and why I'm here today, when Tim gave me the call and said, you know, we really need to talk about parent resiliency and talk about advocacy, especially during these times of a pandemic and what we need to do. I said to Tim, okay, you know, is it okay if I can share my story? He said, absolutely, because we have to anchor in our whys and we have to anchor in from our own selves to figure out how we can help not only ourselves, but other people. And so from there, um, Peter Senge is something that I've been reading during my doctoral studies. And this was a quote that stood out to me where he says that it takes challenges in order to wake up and discover what actually matters to us and to find the courage to pursue it. But the awakening is not in the event itself. It is in ourselves and being a servant of a larger whole ultimately involves a shift in will accessible to all who come to understand and choose it. I came to understand and choose what that was for me. And that was giving back to the community that supported me, um, which was special education. And so my entry into this work was because of my own rooted experience going to two different school districts. As you heard, we're from Long Island. Um, you heard it loud and clear. Um, we have 126 school districts. My home school district is Roseville, born and raised, love it. But we had some struggles in terms of our schools. Um, and at that time, there wasn't a full support system for special education as Good it is. Morning. And so as a result of that, my parents advocated 
uh, for me to go to another public school that was 20 minutes away to receive the services. And so you can imagine I'm going on my own yellow bus every day to another public school and it was a tale of two worlds. I went from a community that was 75% African-American and Hispanic to now being the only African-American in my class. Um, and so I had to learn very quickly about the importance of adaptation and the importance of change and dealing with these issues. But it, took, it takes a village. And so not only did I graduate when I my bachelor's and master's, not only did I become president of my class actually for four consecutive years, unbeknownst to me of that, um, but now I'm pursuing my doctoral studies. And so all this is to say, not everybody is gonna be able to have a similar pathway of excellence or success, but that doesn't mean that they get a chance to at least live. And the question is, how do we take our village? How do we take each other to build that out? And that was really the foundation of my organization, Choice for All. And as Sarah already shared with you already, you know, I started it from the basement <laughs> of my house um, with a hope and a dream of changing outcomes for our children. And as Sarah shared with you, we have 20 different programs that are centered around education, health, and income. But while we provide all these direct services, which is great and wonderful, it gives people relief, the real work also lies in ensuring that systems adequately respond to the needs of our kids. And that is anchored through parent leaders. And so this work that we do here, for instance, with this conference, starts that conversation about how do we network with each other? How do we partner with each other to ensure the fact that you're able to navigate through systems, whether it is working with a uh, social worker, a home visitor, um, an EI coordinator, how do you work across them to ensure that you are there? And so without that foundation of my life journey, I wouldn't be able to center in on my why, which is kids. And those are my babies, they're my heart. <laughs> I call them my babies. I'm not a parent, but I am an uncle of seven nieces and one nephew. And I take any kid that you trust me with as my own. Um, and because of that, it's so important to actually understand and live that. But what I do know, and what I do anchor from parents, including my own pack that even while on the train ride, I was so nervous to do this speech because I was like, I don't know if they're gonna see me as you know, a parent. And I was hooked on that. And he said, Jacob, you just need to speak on your truth. Um, and understanding that, what was so important to me was to speak my truth of what I understand. And so I hope this is affirmative of what I do share for the remaining of our time together in regards to what this work is. Where number one, there is no handbook in parenting, right? But parenting in and of itself is an act of resiliency. It is an act of advocacy, right? And when we're talking about that, I've learned four lessons um, that I think are really important throughout my journey in working with families. Number one, resiliency is really believing in your gut that you need more and that your child needs more. To not only be healthy, but to be your best selves where that you would never settle, right? And the second component is that resiliency is not an end goal. It's really a journey and it takes time and intentionality, um, but it's like building a muscle where it's gonna have tools of flexibility, but especially when facing life stressors. It's also gonna embrace vulnerability. This work is emotional, <laughs> right? And it leads into paths of wellness because sometimes when we touch those heartstrings and it gets really rough, it's very easy to avoid it. But when we start digging into the uncomfortableness and figuring out how do we get to a space of healing that, that peace, it's so beautiful on the other side. Um, and I think that's also important about resiliency that it opens doors and relationships. Um, and by seeking opportunities or spaces that you haven't been in before, enables you to ask the central question of what's opportunity is there to bounce back? Um, what's the new connections that I can build? And so Harvard University the Center of Development Child with this really quick framework. Some of you may notice it, some of the practitioners in the room, but you guys have a lot of different stressors, right? You have job loss with COVID, physical distancing, closed schools, and then you have some of the positive outcomes, right? For some who still have access to childcare, but not all communities have access to childcare. We still have childcare deserts that we're all working actively to you know, erase, or whether dealing with unemployment benefits, even though that might be running out for some folks, or even with stable housing. Whatever your situation is, it's a constant balancing act. And it causes you to figure out how to be able to manage that. 
But then we could start talking about tools, right? Of like, yes, let's reduce the sources of stress. And yes, let's add more supportive relationships around that. And let's move some of the core skills where we could feel more balanced, right? But in between all that though, we're still then get another factor adding in the pandemic. And what we're experiencing is not normal, right? In fact, the new normal isn't normal either, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just not. But what we're dealing with is about change and adaptation, right? And it's important to acknowledge that this is hard. But really, when we have to look at things that are beyond our control, how do we support each other? How do we make sure that we're prepared as much as we can um, for our kids in this new environment? And so what I really want us to think about as we go through the rest of this day is, is it really normalcy that we're looking for or are we really thriving for balance and consistency back in our lives, right? And so in this end, it's really important that when we're trying to use the word normal, that really captures all of the different emotions, be direct with what you're manifesting. Do you need peace? Do you need additional resources? Do you need more support? Do your kids need opportunities? Does your community need the stop sign to be added on? What is the true vision for your family to be stable and strong? Because once you start identifying that point, that begins your path of advocacy. And so for us, um, I was inspired by a mom um, who did a blog on advocates um, for parents. And she similarly did advocate where she used each letter to describe a skill. So I'm gonna do my own twist to that um, of eight tips or tools in becoming or strengthening your role. All right, so we're gonna start with A. Affirm your children and affirm yourself. Affirm your children and affirm yourself. Advocate starts with the belief that you are one and you're already resilient, but you have to trust your God. As Donna shared with me, one of my PAC leaders, you know what you know. All right. And however, there's going to be times in this journey of advocacy where you may feel lost and unsure and or people are really understanding you. And when that happens, there's some questions that are important that you need to go back to. Number one, what's ultimately my end goal? Right. Number two, what do I know so far? Number three, what do I believe in my gut that I'm missing? And last, what do I believe we need for my child to reach success? Because that's going to anchor your work ahead. All right, and so that's A. But while you're doing that, you also need to get some affirmations, not just for your children, but for yourselves. So notice how similar these things are, right? We tell our children how smart and amazing they are, and we encourage their gifts and talents and abilities, and we help them accomplish their goals, right? Sarah tells me all the time, she talks to her children every morning, affirmations in front of a mirror. What do you do for yourselves as adults? Right? Do you do that to yourselves? Do you go in the morning and look at yourself? It seems funny. It's like, oh, no, I don't know. I'm just trying to get out the door. But it makes a difference in how you engage in your day, right? By telling yourself how smart and amazing you are. Y'all smart, y'all amazing. I see it out here. I felt the energy. It's there, <laughs> right? Encouraging your gifts and talents and figuring out ways to navigate through those goals. Because at the end of the day, we all want to be seen. We all want to be heard. We all want to know you matter. And guess what? You do. All right, so that's A. D, do your homework and document. Seems really simple, but it's really hard, especially for people with bad organization skills. One of them, um, I try my best, but you know, my book bag is a mess and my staff just keeps yelling at me all the time, but do your homework and document. And here's the reason why. It's important in any aspect of your advocacy journey, especially as issues arise, that you begin to have clear notes of what's going on. And you need to focus on those notes on the five W's, right? The who, what, where, how, and why. And then you need to create a template that works for you, right? It doesn't have to be particular. Sarah has a notebook, right? Um, Eugenia has, four or five books that I've seen her gone through where she keeps things organized into it. She even told me the other day we were at the train station, you need to put something in a photo album of your pictures of your journey. And I realized it's documenting my journey in this, but similarly, what works for you to make sure that you're able to capture what's happening? V, voice, right? Voice your thoughts and your concerns because the root of advocacy is voicing your concerns um, and really ensuring that it directly addresses the needs of your child. But I think it's really important to emphasize this. It does not need to sound eloquent or sophisticated. It just needs to sound like you. I need to repeat that one more time. It does not need to sound like anybody else. It needs to sound like you. That creates an intimidation when you're walking into a room, whether it's an IEP meeting in front of a caseworker, and sometimes you feel like there's terminology being sent over, things like that. 
Speak on what you know, because it's going to make a difference in terms of that. Also, it is certainly your place to be involved in your child's learning. It is certainly in your place to navigate the system that you need to get resources. Sometimes people feel like I'm overstepping because it's the system, whatever you define that. That's your place. And also recognizing that speaking for your child is an emotional process. That in and of itself is part of what resiliency and vulnerability is about. You're going to be emotional when you're talking about your kids. So if you cry, it is okay. If you are upset, it is okay. But it's also leaning with how do you deal with that with respect? Oh, observe the space, own your space. And what I mean by observing the space really is who's in the room, right? What role do they play in your child's learning environment? Who's navigating this journey with you? And is the energy in the room aligned with this key goal, which is your child? Anytime any of these questions don't be affirmed, just gently pause and go, hi, we need to take a step back for a second. I've seen Sarah do that before in IEP meetings where she's like, hi, I'm sorry. Can you just define what you do here for me? It's very clear because at the end of the day, you're making this decision for your child, right? And it's key that you have to be able to get that through. Own your space also is a part of that. You deserve a seat at the table. You deserve to lead or co-lead the table. And it may feel intimidating, but trust me, just trust your gut. Be as present as possible and engage as an advocate for what's best for your child. Okay, so this is gonna be the tough part. C, challenge with compassion and clarity. So when we're talking about challenge, we're meaning every space of advocacy is created because you're filling in a gap. I don't have this. So therefore I need to make sure this happens so my child feels safe. That creates sometimes a tension, right? Between you and X. Doesn't have to be a person, it could be the system. And then sometimes if you're in a meeting with that teacher, that teacher is represented not just that, but the school. Or if it's a childcare worker, it's that in the childcare system, right? And so we have to recognize the humanity in all this and figuring out how do we hold people accountable? And that's through compassion and clarity. And I wanna clarify what those two words mean because sometimes that could be misconstrued. Compassion means that you're we're talking about the action and the behavior itself, not devaluing the person. What I'm talking about is the timeliness, the tardiness, the, the thoroughness, the responsiveness, the skills. We're not talking about the character. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we get misconstrued with a person's integrity and what we're talking about here is you're not responding in a timely manner for my child to get the resource. Clarity also means being direct and concise and giving specifics, right? Engaging with clear intentions where vagueness can sometimes get into the way. Notice I, at any point, I did not write the word tone in this. And I wanna say it because it is particularly important when we talk about tone and saying have a respectful tone when you speak with someone, there could be potential bias in the statement of what you're saying. And let me give an instance. We're talking about gender bias, and if we're looking through an intersectional lens, gender and race, more specifically, women of color, women and women of color together. Because someone may speak and may say, I am asserting myself and advocating, and you may receive that as aggressive. And that immediately takes this thing away from the conversation and now it became personal when our goal here was I needed you to hear me about what was going on with my child and I need to figure it out and on both ends how do we make sure that we get that done the other a is authentic listening there's a difference between active listening and authentic listening both are important but they have different outcomes. Active listening, you could talk about asking questions, paraphrasing back, being present, being attentive, eye contact, all that's great. But did you hear me? Did you hear me? Did you really get what I'm saying, right? And that's a really hard thing for find quality, right? There's like no metric of how do you check that off and say that it's done. But realistically, the way how you could get that done is by just simply saying, I'm not sure if I understand what you're saying. Can you just make sure that I get that correct? Because I want to do this right. Being honest with your proof point, it's really key for that. T, teach your children and model with your partners, right? As advocates, you're leading by example, not just for the children, but the people who you're working with, who should be your partners in this work, right? And one of the best things as parents is to show, model, lead, and teach your children how to advocate for themselves. Um, this is really key, right? It could be as simple as writing a letter, 
It could be something as simple as standing up for a conversation. I just had a, 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 a story with Sarah where she shared that Anaya had a little conversation with her kindergarten teacher where she went from a program where uh, she had uh, naps and she had snacks. She walked into her kindergarten program and she said, okay, so when's nap time? We don't have nap time, the teacher said. Okay, so when do we have snacks? We don't have snacks. Oh no, we have to have snacks. And what happened? The whole classroom changed. They had snacks in their program. And so while you're looking at a kindergartner who thinks that they're not advocating for themselves, that was a modeled example of what that looks like, right? And not only that classroom got it, but the whole kindergarten group got snacks now integrated into their program. And it's still there, all right? So that was five years old talking about, I want snacks in my program. And then, oh, that was really cute. But realistically, she was advocating like, no, I need food to be, do this, <laughs> right? And so that's what I'm saying. It's so important to teach and model those ways. And lastly, uh, E, which is really embracing your wins and the bumps on the road. Um, it's important to find a silver lining in the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, and embracing the wins because this journey is not gonna be easy, but find those moments to celebrate. Um, the hard lessons. I remember my mom when one point I didn't do well in a spelling test. And she's like, you know what? We're going to go eat. We're going to go celebrate. And then we're going to go practice your test again. And I was like, oh my God, because I'm usually getting A's and B's. Like, I don't want to go home with this. I can't do this. And she's like, we're, come on, it's okay. We're going to celebrate that it was a, you know, difficult today, but we're going to figure this out. I'm like, why are we celebrating something that's difficult? I don't understand. But it was the hard lesson of understanding that it was effort. And how do we change that, right? And so sometimes we miss that when we're all about one area and not taking a step back. And so that's why it's important that you embrace your wins and the bumps on the road. And so this is advocate, right? So if you wanna take a picture and a screenshot, I know how y'all do socialize <laughs> on there, right? So we affirm your children and affirm yourself. You do your homework and you document. You voice your thoughts and your concerns. Not only do you observe the space, but you own your space. You challenge with compassion and clarity. Uh, you lean with authentic listening. You teach your children to model your partners and you embrace your wins and the bumps of the road. You will totally have the beautiful skill sets to start and or strengthen your advocacy. And this is just from my lived experience. And I'm sure people can fine tune this in their own way. And that's part of it, right? Take this and run. Do what you think will best for it. But it at least provides a blueprint. Um, because I saw all this through uh, my own examples of my parents. Um, and even though she's here as a staff member, we usually ever not talk about our relationship. But it was my own mom um, who's there. And so she's in the back. Um, I know she's probably embarrassed by this. <laughs> but um, she is the one <laughs> that got me through this. So you can see how far back we go from the womb. <laughs> but really, um, all those things came from not just her, but through the lived experience of parents and really realizing the importance of, as you can see with it, with that microphone, that you do have a voice um, and that you are somebody. And at the end of the day, you are enough. Um, and so with that said, I really, really thank you all um, for listening to just my story. I hope that if anything, this lands a little bit easier as you go through this conference today and picking your sessions and figuring out what tools do I need to sharpen? What ideas do I need to have to help flourish and grow um, so that together um, we can really build the change that we need to be more responsive to the kids that we serve. And so it has been an absolute gift to be with you all today. So thank you so much. <laughs>